All right. Let's keep going on with the R6RS report. So someone in a comment uh, expressed dissatisfaction that we didn't spend 42 minutes uh, going over the table of contents. But I did make a video earlier where I did go over the table of contents a little bit at least. Um, so I'm somewhat tempted to spend 42 minutes going over the table of contents, but since I've already done that to a lesser extent, I feel like I'm going to move on. All right, so we went through the introduction and we got up to this point, which is the acknowledgements. <clears throat> and I've got mixed feelings about going through the acknowledgements, uh, partly because I know a lot of these people. I mean, I'm, I'm close friends with some of the people. Um, so I think should definitely read the acknowledgements, but I don't really want to read read them out loud. Uh, I f I'm going to feel like I need to comment on <laughs> uh, what I know about people or something like that. That just gets weird. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, but definitely read the acknowledgements. Okay. And I'm just going to leave it as, as is for that. I know that means I haven't literally read every word out loud. Well, deal with it. Okay, we're moving on. We're moving on to, let's see, we are on page five, description of the language. Okay, overview of scheme. This chapter gives an overview of schemes semantics. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the meaning. The purpose of this overview is to explain enough about the basic concepts of the language to facilitate understanding of the subsequent chapters of the report, which are organized as a reference manual. Consequently, this overview is not a complete introduction to the language, nor is it a precise, nor is it precise in all aspects or normative in any way. Okay, so you can't use the overview as, as a specification. This is more <clears throat> high level intuition and a, a basic guideline so you can even understand the language for the rest of it, the rest of the report. Following Algol, which was a European algorithmic language, fa famously Algol 60, I mean, I think there was an ALGO 58, and there's also an ALGO 68 that a lot of people were not big fans of, um, but ALGO 60 seemed to really hit a sweet spot. Follow following ALGO, Scheme is a statically scoped programming language. We've talked about that a little bit. Each use of a variable is associated with a lexically apparent binding of that variable. So it means that, you know, if you do something like let x be plus 3, 4. And we're going to multiply x by x. So we have uses of this variable x. These are variable references. And so each reference, each variable use, we can tell lexically just by looking at the, at the program text that this x is bound to that use. And... Actually, this is a good time to start up a uh, racket. Here we go. Let's start up the good doctor, as Dan calls it. We can we can take this expression and put it in racket. Okay. And so now, if I... Um, mouse over one of these uses of X, you can see this little little arrow, a little line um, that shows what the binding is, okay? And let's see if I can do something uh, a little more interesting. Let's shadow X. Okay. 
Okay, so so this x, this use of x in the right hand side of the innermost let binding uh, refers to the the x that's bound in the outer let, and then the two x's in the body uh, refer to the let that's bound in the inner let. Okay, not the outer let. So. Dr. Rackett's UI can show you statically without running the program um, the, the structure of the binding for the variables in your program. So that's a very nice feature. I, I remember a group of, uh, of Lisp programmers seeing this. Uh, Matthew Flat gave a demo and they're like, whoa! <laughs> and Matthew's like, yeah, the technology's advanced in the last uh, 50 years or whatever. <laughs> Uh, but but this is a very nice feature of Dr. Racket. I like this. Um, and and actually this is cool. So if you mouse over uh, the asterisks, you know you could see that that's coming from Racket itself. Okay, because that's built in. That is a primitive. You know it's a variable that's bound to um, the primitive procedure that knows how to do multiplication. Um, and the same with the let, which you know let syntax, but let is also defined in the racket um, language. Okay, so that's very nice. You know, same with plus. Plus is defined. Now, let's just have a little more fun. Uh, let's say <laughs> we're going to define plus uh, to be times. And now let's say plus xx. Okay, so now we just redefined um, locally. I, I shouldn't say we redefined, we let bound. Okay, so within this local scope, actually, let me make this a little more interesting. Let's say we're going to add the result of this let expression. Okay, I'm used to my Emacs uh, commands. Okay, whoops. We're going to add the result of this expression to what we get um, by adding, you know, seven and eight. Okay. And let me make sure my prints match up the way I want. Okay, there we go. All right. So not only have I shadowed X, but I've also shadowed um, plus. So within the body of this uh, innermost let expression. This use of plus uh, refers to the plus bound out here. So in this case, plus is actually uh, the variable use of, of plus. Um, it's going to resolve to the procedure that performs multiplication. Okay, so this will multiply x by x. But notice that these pluses outside the body of the let are still performing the old definition of, of plus. So it's not like we've, you know, modified plus and that it's always now going to do multiplication. That change is only um, not visible within the body of that let expression. Okay, so that's, that's very nice. And notice that Dr. Racket can resolve all these references statically without having to run the program. Oh, very nice. Okay, I can run that. Okay, 184. All right, it's a very nice feature. And uh, even seven and eight are defined in Racket. Okay, three and four are defined in Racket. Well, very cool. And I'm not sure what happens. Okay, so I'm, if I go over the left paren, maybe that's showing the, the nesting structure. A little, I'm not quite sure what that means. Anyway, uh, very, very nice feature. Okay, so that, that was what that means. Each use of a variable is associated with the lexically apparent binding of that variable. Very nice. Scheme has latent as opposed to manifest typing. Okay, so this is where people talk about dynamic typing and static typing. Um, you know, so, so the report uses latent versus manifest. 
types are associated with objects, also called values, rather than with variables. Some authors refer to languages with latent types as untyped, weakly typed, or dynamically typed languages. Now, I certainly wouldn't say that Scheme is untyped. There are untyped languages, which is, you know, to say, hey, you've got a collection of bits and a string and, you know, manipulate them as you as you please. It's like what happens in a traditional CPU where you can take a bit string in a register and treat it any way you want. Uh, so I wouldn't say that Scheme is, is untyped. Um, but I've, I've heard people claim that. Weakly typed, dynamically typed. Usually you hear people say dynamically typed. Um, <clears throat> famously, Bob Harper has said that, you know, languages like Scheme aren't uh, dynamic. Uh, he doesn't like the term dynamically typed. He would say Scheme is a statically, uh, strongly statically typed uh, language that's unityped, where there's only one type, which is basically a giant union of all the possible types for all the values in the language. So that that is the perspective of at least some people. Um, so latent typing is the way the report calls it. Other languages with latent types are Python, Ruby, Smalltalk, and other dialects of Lisp. Languages with manifest types, sometimes referred to as strongly typed or statically typed languages, include Algol 60, C, C Sharp, Java, Haskell, and ML. Okay, great. Now, notice you, know, you can just tell that this text has been added, you know, to a, a either this version of the report or a more recent version of the report because Scheme is considerably older than than Haskell and considerably older than C Sharp and Java. So, um, Scheme has been around since 1975. I don't know when the first report came out, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure this wording, I'm sure this wording didn't exist in the first version. Okay. <clears throat> um, doo -doo. Yeah, just, just one more word about that. So, you know, we've got, in Scheme, we can say, you know, the value of plus three, four is seven. That's the object that they're referring to. And we can ask questions like, so first of all, we can quote seven that evaluates a seven or just seven itself evaluates a seven. That's a self-evaluating literal. And we can ask questions. We can ask, is seven a string? False. Is um, seven a number? Is seven an integer? Yes. Okay. So we can ask questions about the the value, uh, the type, the object. Um, but notice we're talking about the values, not the expressions. So, you know, I can't ask whether or not um, the expression plus three, four will give an integer. Okay. So, you know, I can quote the expression and now it's, that'll just turn the expression into a list at this point. Um, but there's no way for me to statically determine that this expression plus three, four will evaluate to seven. Now, if I want to, I can do things like write a type inferencer in scheme and, you know, do type inference over that expression and figure out the type. However, the full scheme language allows for expressions that, um, you wouldn't type check in in languages like ML. So, you know, you can you can do things like and of well, let's let's do uh, how about this an or of seven, you know, um, hash t, or we can also do an and of ha uh, seven hash t. Okay, so. Here we're, we're doing this pun based on the fact that any value in scheme other than hash alpha is considered true. And also, you know, and and or are short circuiting. And also, um, you know, the, 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 the value of and will be the value 
of the last expression, last argument to AND, if all of the um, arguments evaluate to a non-hash f value. So I could do something like uh, car of cons cat dog. And now I get back the symbol cat. So even though AND in some sense is a Boolean operator, you know, we're playing these games with the types that you wouldn't be able to do in, in ML. Or you could do it in ML, but you would have to do an encoding and you know you wouldn't be using the standard AND. You would have to do, um, you could encode scheme in ML using this unitype perspective. So that's one of Bob Harper's arguments is that you could you know, implement all this in ML if you want and just have a big union type that would express the different types in your version of scheme. That's fine. Uh, but you would have to do some sort of encoding. Now, Bob Harper uses that as an argument, as I understand it, that say ML is, is better or more expressive in some way. Um, I, my perspective is that Scheme has different ways of encoding things than you would get in, say, ML and Haskell. And, and Schemers and Lispers are pretty sophisticated about how to encode things. And, you know, Scheme, as my friend Aziz says, Aziz Gulom is a language or the language of least restriction. And if you want to have a type system, you can add one, you can implement one. If you want to have different types of restrictions, you can add them syntactic restrictions through macros, library-based restrictions, through redefin you know, redefining how core parts of Scheme work. You, know, you can change how Scheme works in very, very deep ways, including giving yourself guarantees that are even stronger than you know, the defaults for ML, where you would have to use a programming discipline in ML. Um, so you can make Scheme super restricted if you want. It's up to you. The, I think the difference is in ML, the choices are made for you. Okay, those are um, sort of very curated, well-reasoned choices by experts where they have a, a very um, finely crafted, you know, uh, language specification, and there's this long tradition of reasoning over those programs. And in Scheme, you're on your own, Okay. Um, I would rather be on my own and I can use the restrictions that make sense to me for the problem I'm solving. But, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a different conversation. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All objects created in the course of a scheme computation, including procedures and continuations, have unlimited extent. Okay. No scheme object is ever destroyed. So if you create a procedure, in theory, you know, that procedure is around forever. <clears throat> if you create a list, in theory, that, that list is around forever. The reason that implementations of scheme do not usually run out of storage is that they are permitted to reclaim the storage occupied by an object if they can prove that the object cannot possibly matter to any future computation. Other languages in which most objects have unlimited extent include C-sharp, Java, Haskell, most list dialects, ML, Python, Ruby, and Smalltalk. So here we're talking about garbage collection, basically, without mentioning the term. So scheme implementations can perform garbage collection. However, importantly, an object cannot be collected unless the system can prove that that object will never matter to any computation in the future. And okay, so that that's a, an important obligation. Now, if there are no references left, you know, if there are no pointers in memory or no way to access an object, for example, that would be one way the system could reason about not affecting the computation. There are also things like weak hash tables where the semantics allow collection, even if there's a pointer from the weak hash table, um, you know, just based on the semantics. So this is really talking about garbage collection. And also this tells you 
um, something interesting about how the spec is written. You know, notice the spec doesn't say anything about garbage collection, um, and also doesn't require an implementation to, you know, collect objects that can't matter to a computation. So you could uh, you could create an implementation of Scheme. It could be compliant with R six R S with no garbage collection, with no reclaiming of memory, or you could have a mode where you could turn off the garbage collection or any sort of memory re reclamation, and that would be fine. That would be standard compliant. There are real cases where people have wanted to run scheme systems, you know, in, in a context where, you know, they were soft real-time systems where the response really mattered and they didn't want to tolerate any sorts of garbage collection pauses. They wanted to make sure that the same computation run twice would have the same performance characteristics, that kind of thing. And they just turned off a garbage collection for a system or, you know, and also famously early uh, Lisp machines, the garbage collection either was non-existent or took a very long time and people would just power cycle those machines periodically instead of, uh, you know, dealing with garbage collection until finally the garbage collection technology got faster and memory sizes also got bigger. Um, okay, great. Implementations of scheme must be properly tail recursive. Here we go. We had a whole side quest for this one. This allows the execution of an iterative computation in constant space even if the iterative computation is described by a syntactically recursive procedure. Thus, with a properly tail recursive implementation, iteration can be expressed using the ordinary procedure call mechanics so that special iteration constructs are useful only as syntactic sugar. So in Scheme, famously, you have the tail recursive loop. You know, um, you can write a recursive definition that's it. You know, so if you want to have a for loop, great. You're writing your for loop in such a way that basically turns into a tail recursive uh, loop. Um, you could argue about the syntax, whether or not that's convenient for Dan Friedman's uh, Feshrift. Olin Shivers gives a talk, which is on my YouTube channel, talking about having a looping uh, syntax that he thinks is nicer because writing tail recursive loops is kind of annoying. Uh, there are lots of ways you can write your own looping constructs. Racket has all sorts of fancy constructs, um, but ultimately you get down to the tail recursive loop. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this uh, anymore right now because I recorded a couple videos trying to figure out exactly what that means to be properly tail recursive and found out that actually there's like a paper chase, uh, several papers deep to to try to get to what does that formally mean to handle tail calls properly and where'd that come from with Guy Steele's uh, master's thesis and the Lambda papers. Anyway, that, that by the way, is like whenever someone says, hey, aren't you gonna run out of things to talk about if you make a thousand videos? Like, no, <laughs> you know, Try, try looking up what proper tail recursive really means or proper handling of tail recursion really means, you know, that could probably be 20 videos right there. So um, each, each thing in this document could be an entire series. We could do an entire series on garbage collection and scheme, you know. All right. Scheme was one of the first languages to support procedures as objects in their own right. Procedures can be created dynamically, stored in data structures, returned as results of procedures, and so, so on. Other languages with these properties include Common Lisp, Haskell, ML, Ruby, and Smalltalk. Yeah, so procedures are first-class objects in Scheme. One distinguishing feature of Scheme is that continuations, which in most other languages only operate behind the scenes, also have first-class status. First-class continuations are useful for implementing a wide variety of advanced control constructs, including non-local exits, backtracking, and coroutines. Okay, so, you know, uh, like Java has this labeled break where you can break out of a loop. 
um, and go to some particular labeled uh, part of your program. So you can do that with call CC, uh, for example. And backtracking, there's famously a two continuation um, approach to backtracking, but you know you can also do this with call CC uh, very nicely. Coroutines, when you go back and forth between two different uh, operations. Okay, so all that you can implement continuations. I guess the other thing I'll say is R6 uh, specifies call with current continuation. So you have this first class, what's called a boarding continuation. I, I think a lot of people in the scheme community think that's probably not a great trade-off, that particular approach. So there are a couple issues. One is there are many optimizations that an optimizing scheme compiler might make where it's not safe to do the optimization because the presence of call call with current continuation or call with current continuation with set bang together means that it's not safe to to make that optimization. And you know, if you think that this procedure is going to return once, well, maybe not. You know, it might return multiple times. All sorts of things like that get complicated. Um, and and also in terms of a programming standpoint as an abstraction, almost every time I've ever wanted call with current continuation, I also end up having to use mutation like, like set bang. So I think the more modern view is that either scheme should get rid of call with current continuation or it should go to something like full delimited continuation where you can you know, say where you want to start <laughs> grabbing the continuation, you know, how much of the stack uh, you want to grab is one way to look at it. Uh, or something like effects handlers, which are, you know, similar to delimited continuations. But um, I think not too many people are super happy with uh, the current setup. I wouldn't be surprised in the future if delimited continuations end up being specified like that that's one change i would probably make it's like okay if you're gonna if you're gonna be serious about continuations you probably want the limited continuations or you know just get rid of it so some people think just get rid of it you can cps it if you want uh, but you know there's a lot of you know there's some costs to to having this in language especially in terms of optimization opportunities that are missed where um uh, you know but you still don't have the the nice control and abstractions that you would have with the limited continuation so you end up having to mutate stuff and it's a little yucky anyway in scheme the argument expressions of a procedure call are evaluated before the procedure gains control whether procedure whether the procedure needs the result of the evaluation or not Okay, so that's like call by value. Um, C, C Sharp, Common Lisp, Python, Ruby, and Smalltalk are all other languages that always evaluate argument expressions before invoking a procedure. This is distinct from the lazy evaluation semantics of Haskell or the call by name semantics of Algo 60, where an argument expression is not evaluated unless its value is needed by the procedure. Okay, so you know, lazy evaluation, semantics of Haskell, also called call, uh, call by need, and um, the call by name semantics of Algo 60. All right, so, you know, what they're getting at is if I want to call, say, plus, um, you know, I can do plus four or five, that's fine. Um, or, or actually, let me do like times, okay? Actually, let me, let me give a better example. I'll just define something from scratch you know, define, ignore my argument. There we go. So I just defined a procedure called ignore my argument. Doesn't matter what I pass in. So I don't know. I get back five pass in cat get back five okay 
So no matter which argument, uh, sorry, which value I pass in to this procedure, the procedure I get from ignore my argument, the result will always be five. Um, but let me think of a couple of other cases. You know, so I could say ignore my argument of omega. I think we talked about omega in a previous video. So I can say lambda x, x applied to x, that applied to itself. Okay, so omega is an expression that diverges, it goes in an infinite loop. So if I pass this in, you know, if it basically I say, all right, we're gonna call ignore my argument with the, the value of this expression, well, that expression doesn't have any value. It just goes in an infinite loop. So if I try calling that procedure, you know, that's just an infinite loop because omega gets evaluated. We need, you know, before the procedure bound to ignore my argument is actually called, this expression must be evaluated. Now, another example would be, uh, let's say I might do something like, um, how about uh, multiply seven by cat? Okay, so that might be my expression. And I get an exception in, in multiplication, okay, because cat, the symbol cat is not a number, all right? So even though ignore my argument doesn't actually pay any attention to the value passed to it, the expression that's in this argument position has to be evaluated, has to actually evaluate to a value before ignore my argument, then has a chance to ignore it. So this is what's called call by value semantics. And almost every programming language um, currently in use has that sort of semantics. So Haskell famously uh, has call by, by need. Algo has call by name. So there are a few languages that use different approaches. Uh, most languages are, are call by value these days. Um, if you were to do the equivalent in Haskell, um, you know, you just get back five because this expression wouldn't be evaluated because you know, we're never using uh, the ignore argument, the ignore me argument. Okay, so, so only if the ignore me argument um, was actually referenced within the body and used within the body would the uh, expression have to be evaluated either in call by value or call by name. So. That, that is a significant difference in semantics, and it's important to know that scheme works this way. I, I will also say that if you want scheme to operate in a call by name or call by need way, it is possible to, to modify scheme. So, you know, once again, scheme is very flexible, as Aziz says, it's the language of least restriction, so you can play games with all these things. Okay. Schemes model of arithmetic provides a rich set of numerical types and operations on them. Furthermore, it distinguishes exact and inexact number objects. Essentially, an exact number object corresponds to a number exactly, and an inexact number object is the result of a computation that involved rounding or other errors. Okay. I, I at least have heard that the R5RS arithmetic model was kind of messed up, at least consider, you know, considering IEEE floating point semantics and all that sort of thing. I'm not an expert in this area. Scheme has what's called um, a tower, a, a numeric tower that has different types. So you have numbers and then integers or a type of number that kind of thing. And then you also have this notion of exact and inexact num um, objects, number objects. So let's just look at exact and inexact. Well, so, okay, so first of all, you know, we have things like, you know, numbers of various sorts, okay? And uh, we can have what are sometimes called big nums, all right? So nothing here about how big a number can be. A number can be as big as you want, at least an integer. 
Now, if I do something like divide 7 by 22, okay, here is where we get into the exact versus inexact. The result of that division is a rational. Okay, so we have an integer as the numerator and an integer as the denominator. So that is a rational number. And I can ask if that's exact. I think, let's see, how do I enter that? Do I just do this? Yeah, I can just do that. Okay, so that is an exact number. Now, if I want to, I can produce an inexact uh, approximation. So, uh, for example, I can do 22.0. All right, now, instead of the rational 7 over 22, I get an approximation, which is going to be some IEEE floating point, you know, single or double precision um, number, that kind of thing. So now you start getting into IEEE floating point standards and all, all those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, so uh, I could also put the decimal point here. The other thing I could do is um, I could take my exact number and I could call exact arrow inexact. I could take that exact number and I can treat it as an inexact. I can also do things like, okay, so now let, let's see what happens if we take this and try to treat it as an exact. Inexact to exact of that. All right, so now notice we didn't get seven out of twenty seven over twenty two back. Okay, we got that monstrosity over that monstrosity. Um, so we must have lost some precision when we converted from the exact to inexact. And in fact, if you look at this uh, decimal approximation, it looks like it's repeating this one eight forever. And then that two is just rounding up um, the next one eight part. okay, so so if you wrote this down, in standard math notation, this would be 0 0.318 with a, a, a little bar over the 18 so showing that that repeats forever. But you can't re you know, express that exactly with this uh, approximation, this, this fixed length decimal approximation. So we've lost some precision. And so instead of 7 over 22, we end up with this thing. Now, there's sometimes where... Uh, we don't have a problem. So, for example, I can do something like say, okay, so now that's something I memorized as a kid that's useless. Um, okay, so with this number, I can do something like take the floor of it. All right, and now I have 3.0. I can ask, is that exact or inexact? Okay, that is not exact, that is inexact. However, what I can now do is do inexact to exact, and I get three, which is what I wanted. So. In some cases, you can go, you know, you can do these operations with things like floors and ceilings, get the decimal approximation or the IEEE approximation to what you want. I shouldn't say decimal. And then do this uh, inexact to exact conversion. So there, there are ways you can go back and forth that way. But you have to be careful in general because um, you're likely to lose precision. Okay. And there's this whole field of numerical analysis that talks about these things you know there there is a trade-off so when you have a rational uh, and when you have something like 7 over 22 the nice thing is you haven't lost any precision and it's also an abstraction okay so you don't have to care about i triple e floating point numbers and if it's double precision single precision all those sorts of things and all the kind of weird situations that come up however uh, this 7 over 22 is likely to be extremely slow if you're doing arithmetic. So if you have like a matrix 
of numbers represented this way and you try to do things. Or, you know, what one person told me that, you know, they did an assignment and uh, their students were, you know, uh, doing fractals, I think it was. They were trying to do fractal images and it was super, super slow to generate the fractals. And it turned out that um, they were using these exact rationals instead of the floating point and so yes their their fractions were or sorry their their fractals uh in some sense were very exact but what ended up happening was these numbers grew to be gigantic and so you can imagine you know these these uh, the numerator and the denominator can grow to be arbitrarily large right so you might have a a numerator that's 500 decimal digits you know that kind of thing so that Arithmetic is going to be slow. Um, all right, so that's uh, exact versus inexact. And there are also complex numbers, all sorts of other things that we'll get to later. Um, yeah, all right. Basic types. Scheme programs manipulate objects, which are also referred to as values. Scheme objects are organized into sets of values called types. Okay, so... So it's not true the scheme is untyped. It has types of values. This section gives an overview of the fundamentally important types of the scheme language. More types are described in later chapters. And, you know, not only does scheme have types, but it enforces the types at runtime. So we've already seen if you try doing something like that, you get runtime exception. Okay, if we were in a truly untyped language that would be allowed you know cat would be treated uh, treated as a bit string that could be you know could represent a number that kind of thing um, if you want to see all sorts of weird examples like that in languages that i guess technically aren't untyped but show behavior that looks untyped in some sense because of the coercion of the types you know you can look at gary bernhard's uh wat talk which is a great talk all right. Um, this section gives an overview of the fundamentally important types of the scheme language. More types are described in later chapters. Note, as scheme is latently typed, the use of the term type in this report differs from the use of the term in the context of other languages, particularly those with manifest typing. So if you talk to an ML programmer or a Haskell programmer, for example, or an Agda or Idris programmer, you know, their notion of what type means uh, is probably going to be different. That, that, that by the way, I think is, is the biggest source of deep um, confusion or misunderstanding is when two people are using a technical term in different ways. And usually the result is people start accusing each other of acting in bad faith. Um, that's a particularly nasty type of disagreement. Um, this is, I guess, why philosophers try to start off by defining their terms. Okay, Booleans. A Boolean is a truth value and can be either true or false. Um, by the way, Dan Friedman would always capitalize this because it was named after a person, George Boole. Um, True or false, okay. In scheme, the object for false is written hash F. The object for true is written hash T. In most places where a truth value is expected, however, any object different from hash F counts as true. Okay, so there are a couple interesting things. So there are these constants, hash T, hash F. They are self-evaluating literals. They evaluate to themselves. You can quote them if you want, but it's not necessary. Okay. By the way, you can't quote them twice and have the same thing because that evaluates the quote hash t. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we have true, true and false constants. Um, that's fine. So those are booleans, and and there's a boolean type predicate. Okay. But if I say something like, quote, false, that is not a Boolean. Um, 
this is the other thing I find interesting. In most places where a truth value is expected, however, any object different from hash f counts as true. All right, let's just see an example of that. I can say if 5, then the value of the if is 6, otherwise it's 7. That works just fine. No problem. I can put in hash f if I want, or I can put in hash t. Okay, so then it works exactly as you would expect, but you don't have to put in a Boolean expression there. So I could do uh, plus 3, 4. And I'll call that 10. Okay, well, that works just fine because this expression evaluates to a value that's not hash f. Now I could I could do something like uh, zero question mark of five. Well, that will evaluate to hash f. So we would expect to get back 10. And sure enough, we do. Okay, so that's a little pun. Once again, in ML or Haskell, this sort of game is either disallowed or you would have to do an encoding like we were talking about before. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're going to enforce that you have an honest-to-goodness Boolean value for their conditional tests unless you play some games with encodings and that sort of thing. Whether or not this is a classy design decision, I don't know, but it's a, it's a useful pun that allows you to write code that's shorter is the way I'd say it. And Scheme makes a lot of these sorts of decisions. Maybe not the best for teaching. Like if you just want to have a version of language that, that's uh, easy for a student to understand, you know, this pun maybe doesn't help things. Racket famously has a, a number of restricted teaching languages uh, for students to, you know, learn a subset of Racket and then they get more and more power over time. I don't know how Racket handles this. They might restrict, uh, you know, Booleans to hash T and hash F in the beginning. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, that's that's a trade-off that you see in Scheme. Scheme will consistently make these sorts of puns easy so that you can write code that's shorter. Um, and so there's a lot of punish code in Scheme. Um, okay. And, and some of the code for Mini Canron, like if you look at the first edition of Mini Canron, of uh, Reason Schemer, if you look at some of the code in that implementation of, of Mini Canron, you'll see some puns related to this. Um, and I think we backed off on some of those later. I was like, yeah, it's not, not real friendly to someone who doesn't know Scheme or who's trying to port Scheme to a different, I mean, Mini Canron to a different language. Numbers. Scheme supports a risk, rich variety of numerical data types, including objects representing integers of arbitrary precision, rational numbers, complex numbers, and inexact numbers of various kinds. Chapter 3 gives us an overview of the structure of Scheme's numerical tower. Um, complex numbers, I don't know if I've ever used those in anger in Scheme. I don't know, maybe once doing doing like some fractal stuff or something. I just haven't haven't done much with it. Um, yeah, I always have to look that one up. But the, the other types I've used. All right, characters. Scheme characters mostly correspond to textual characters. More precisely, they are isomorphic to the scalar values of the Unicode standard. So this is a big change. The previous versions of the scheme spec didn't support Unicode. I think that's correct. R5 didn't. I don't think the IEEE uh, spec did. So this is a big, a big difference. And um, so, you know, we can have characters like that. And I think there are ways to do like Unicode code points or something. I don't remember how to do this. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Okay. There's some way to do that. Uh, okay, string. So, so this is my R5 part. Like, you know, I, I know R5. R5 just didn't have that stuff. So I get confused sometimes. That's why we're going through this. Strings. Strings are finite sequences of characters with fixed length and thus represent arbitrary Unicode texts. Great. A symbol 
is an object representing a string. Okay, so we're getting on the next page. Well, let's just try something for fun here, okay? Let's just try, all right, let's do a string like hello. Okay, and so we can do string arrow list of hello, and we get the characters, okay? Now, um, dare I try some, uh, yeah, sure, let's do, let's do some Kana here. Um, how about, I don't know. Whatever that is, uh, all right, let me, try. <laughs> okay, I'm, I can tell I'm in trouble. Uh, I have no idea what this says, by the way. I hope, I, my apologies if it's uh, some horrible obscenity. Let me turn back to US. All right, so is that, yay, that's a string. I, I don't even think this is legal because I don't think you begin word with mm. <laughs> cheek. Chikaka chi and chikaka chi. I have no idea what that if that's even a thing. I've never. I don't know what that would mean. All right. So let's see these Unicode characters. Oh. Really? You can just do that. Oh. Okay. That worked much better than I thought. So I should be able, I guess, like copy this. And then replace that. Okay, and then if I quote that, does that work? Cool. And so I can take the car of that. Get the character. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. All right. Um, and I forget, is there, is the list arrow string also? All right, there we go. Easy peasy. That's that seemed much easier. Now there's some control characters that's not going to work with because they're like invisible characters. Um, so th there are are other ways to encode these things with numbers. At least Shay supports that. Uh, we'll learn about that more as we go through the spec. All right, um, that's it. We're done the page, so we're finished for today. Uh, that was page five, description of language. All right, very good. All right, thank you, and hope to talk to you soon.